Hello and welcome to On That If I Want To. I'm Andrea Mari of Drea Renee Knits and today I am wearing my just released tessellated cardigan. I'll even stand up and show ya. So I knit the cropped version. It also comes instructions with instructions for full length and you can see it has its drop shoulder. A lot of times if you've been following along here I tend to knit my drop shoulders with quite a bit of positive ease, usually up to like 10 inches, sometimes more. This, I just wanted to see how I would feel about drop shoulder silhouette with less ease. And I like it. So this I did just four inches and it has just a nice little v-neck. It's a really classic, cute little cardi. It looks great with all different kinds of outfits. And I am just so tickled with how it turned out. So, anyways, it's, it's here, and I will, of course, include links below. I used the Spinster's Daughter, which is a collaboration yarn between the Farmer's Daughter Fibers and Spin Cycle Yarns. Spin Cycle mills the yarn, and then Farmer's Daughter Fibers dyes it. And then with that, I used Spin Cycle Yarns dyed in the wool, which creates that lovely color shift which you'll notice in this one, I decided to go low contrast. So in um, red plaid actually, which is the first of the series, but is the only one that has a different name. <laughs> um, that's also pretty low contrast, but for the tessellated vest pullover, and I would say the socks, I did more of a high contrast look with the color work. And it was so fun to play with it doing low contrast. And the reason I love it as a, I just think it looks so pretty. But also, typically when we're doing color work, a lot of times we want crisp contrast. We are trying to see a motif or a stitch pattern. So we want those values to be quite different so we can really see the image we're trying to create with our stitches. But with this stitch pattern, I think it looks so beautiful, both high or low contrast which I just think is so fun because it takes a little of the pressure off because you can really play around with your colors and it doesn't have to be this perfect, like must be able to see all the little stitch definition or anyways, I love, I actually think that the slow contrast version is my favorite. Don't tell my other ones, but I, I'm going to say it's bold. It's a bold statement, but I'm going to say it. I think this is my favorite. So, and I don't think I mentioned the fuzzy, so you're gonna see this lovely halo happening. Let me see if I can get up close. Focus up my sleeve, see this halo, ooh la la. So that is from the Baby Surrey Alpaca, which is Odang from the Farmer's Daughter Fibers, which is named because you touch it and you're like, oh dang. So anyways, that's what I'm wearing today. And let's, jump into some questions. I am still getting over being sick. I think I mentioned last week that I wasn't feeling great. Well, after four years, four years of dodging it, my family finally got hit with COVID. So I was already sick for a week and then COVID came and I got sicker and my family joined me. <coughs> so excuse me, I am going to hold it together, but please forgive it's like all right here still, so I'm still kind of getting over it, but let's answer some questions. All right, question number one is about patterns that are good for hand spun. My question is, what makes a pattern appropriate for hand spun? Why are some pat patterns better than others? So I loved this question because at the end of the day, any pattern can be knit in hand spun. Hand spun is just yarn, it's yarn. So if, you, if that yarn that you spun or that you bought from a spinner is, can get you the gauge and the fabric you like for a pattern, then you can use it. Um, and when I say that, I mean, if you can match the gauge listed in the pattern and, um, and you don't have to end up with like a crazy, I'm getting distracted by something I'm, this, this is what I'm being distracted by. I picked up blocks from the fleece I bought this year and stuck out was like, ah. Okay. So. I should, this is like one of those times. 
that's where I know I should restart. But I'm also going to blame this on getting sick. My, I am just not creating the thoughts and getting them to my mouth in the way I would like to since I have not been feeling good. So let's try this again. What makes a pattern good for a hand spun? You can use your hand spun for any pattern. But what you want to make sure of is that you get gauge, the gauge called for in the pattern, because otherwise nobody can guarantee that it will turn out the size you are hoping it will turn out. But also you don't want to push a yarn so far one way or the other in attempting to get gauge that you then don't like the resulting fabric. Like you don't, let's say your hand spun's a little bulkier than it should be for the pattern you want in it. You don't want to just keep going down a needle size to the point where you just have this like super stiff fabric or other side of the spectrum, your hand spun's cobweb lace and you're trying to use it for a fingering or sport weight project, but by the time you get gauged, you have to use needles that are so big that you have this really open fabric that's gonna not turn out into what you want it to be. So, but let's answer the actual question here is what makes a pattern good for hand spun? So when I have said that in the past, a lot of times I'm talking about patterns that either have some flexibility and gauge, hello traveler cowl, where you have the option to knit to a certain dimension, which means you don't have to spin to a specific yarn weight, um, especially because even within my own spin group, I've seen how drastically we might all spin up a certain braid where the density, the grist of that yarn is going to vary so widely from person to person to person. Some of us are going to have this really light, airy yarn that's going to have way more yardage than somebody else who is has more twist, they're squeezing out more of the air, they're putting more fiber into every little inch um, so that their yarn is a lot heavier and denser and they don't have as much yardage. So when a pattern can be knit to a specific dimension, that gives you some flexibility. You can still pair up the needles that are going to give you the fabric you really like, um, because you're knitting to a measurement instead of a specific stitch and row gauge. Otherwise, when I have mentioned a pattern being really great for hand spun, it is because there's a lot of texture or it looks really great without a texture. So if your hand spun yarn is a bit on the inconsistent side, which for many of us it is, we're not machines, we're humans, and the yarn we create is going to have a tendency, even if it's just a little bit, to maybe be a little more thick or thin than something that a machine can create. So patterns that look great with that added texture or that are really great at hiding that extra texture are other ones I mentioned in the past. The first sweater I ever knit with my hand spun was the nurtured sweater. I should be, I should be writing these down for you. So I said the traveler cowl, which I designed literally to be helpful for spinners. Traveler, I forgot how to spell that word. <laughs> and nurtured sweater. So the nurtured sweater has this stitch pattern that is all texture and it is totally great with thick and thin yarn. So again, first sweater quantity I ever spun, which was within like my third spin. I mean, I very quickly jumped in to larger quantities of yarn and fiber. So, and it worked, turned out great. I've posted pictures. You can find them around. Um, I might have made a Ravelry page. I can't remember. But anyways, that is a great one because it can kind of hide those inconsistencies. And then there have been patterns that people have just naturally loved to knit with their hand spun. That includes the shift cowl, night shift, um, the traveler shawl. Again, I knit that out of my hand spun but anything that utilizes the way we may choose to play with color in our hand spun, a lot of times is when I'll also talk about it. Um, so those fractal spins, things like that, that just look really beautiful within color work, um, especially in patterns like the shift. So that is what I am talking about, is basically, yeah, textured or gauge-friendly patterns so that I personally kind of like to start with my hand spun and then choose the pattern. I find it, for me, when it comes to spinning, my joy doesn't necessarily coming from trying to perfectly match a commercial yarn or trying to get an exact yarn weight. I will spin with a yarn weight in mind for sure, but it's not my end goal. My end goal isn't to be like technically perfect with this like 
perfectly spun worsted weight yarn. Um, so for me, I'd rather spin, see what yarn weight I end up with, and then be like, oh, this is a great pattern that would work for that. So, whew. All right, I'm gonna pull it together. These next four questions are gonna be even better. I'm gonna stay focused and it's gonna be great. So two questions, this person snuck in an extra question, but I'm gonna give it to them because the first one's pretty easy to answer. Uh, can you post a link to the sewing pattern for the navy sweatsuit you wore this week? So that was in my last <coughs> um, video and yes so the sweatshirt is the penny raglan i love that sweatshirt i have sewn two for me and one for my husband super solid pattern love how it fits um so that i will link below and then the pants are actually the berry pants those are my go-to pants i have made a lot of those um including now two pairs of them as sweatpants all I did was seven sweatshirt fabric. So, um, but I will put that link below. I will say I realized this morning as I was grabbing that link, I forgot that it has a ruffled uh, waistband. I've never done the ruffled waistband. It's not my jam. I don't wear shirts that work well with a ruffled waistband. So I just do a classic um, encased waistband that is just, I actually even sub in the waistband I really like. So, but I just wanted to say, I realized people are gonna look at that pattern and see this ruffled waistband that I've never done. So you don't have to do it either unless you like it. Um, it might be a little intense on the sweatpants though, if you do try to do these with sweatpants as well, but highly recommend. I love that sweatsuit. I have worn it every single day this week, especially when I wasn't feeling good. And then finally I was like, okay, I need to wash this. <laughs> All right, the second question is the top-down, bottom-up debate. I'm going to need a drink before I get started on this one. I have a strong preference for a top-down sweater construction as I find I can better dial in the fit compared to bottom-up. As a matter of course, I will reverse engineer most sweaters that are constructed bottom-up in order to work them top-down. From a designer's perspective, how do you decide whether to construct a sweater bottom up or top down? Um, what drives the decision to design a sweater top up or bottom down? I said that backwards, top down or bottom up. Um, and I know certain stitch patterns perhaps lend themselves better to having decreases worked in pattern rather than increases. So perhaps that's one consideration, but are there others? So this question gets asked all the time. A lot of people wonder this one. For instance, this is a bottom up sweater. So for me, a lot of times it depends on the style of the sweater. Whether or not you wanna work shaping as increases or decreases also I think is a, lot of is a big deciding factor for a lot of designers as well. I think it's kind of safe to say that there are many designers who also fall into a camp of either bottom up or top down. I feel like that's more strongly with top-down designers. I think there are designers out there who only design top-down sweaters. That's just their jam and that is how their brain works and that is how they're gonna construct their sweaters. Um, <clears throat> I'm not one of them. I like to mix it up. I'll do bottom up, I'll do top down. I don't mind doing it either way. So what affects my decision can be do I want to use increases or decreases in my shaping? Which one works better with what I'm trying to do with stitch patterns, designs, stuff like that? You were spot on there. But then there's also decisions to be made, such as with a uh, drop shoulder. So I think all of my drop shoulder sweaters are knit from the bottom up, and I do have specific reasons for that. One of those reasons is the shoulder construction. So I know that there are beautiful <laughs> top down, I wanted to say bottom down again, <laughs> top down drop shoulder sweater patterns out there. But what I like about working them bottom up is this three needle bind off for me is incredibly aesthetically pleasing. You'll notice that I pretty much always leave it exposed. I love the line. I have a lot of, I have a few patterns that will actually take this line right across the back neck. I love how it draws the eye right across. I also love the stability it adds. I like the strength of this three needle bind off. So one of the options if you're working a drop shoulder top down is people might choose to do a provisional cast on here. 
and then they're going to work part of the shoulder this way and then they're going to put that provisional cast on back on their needle and then they're going to work it this way which will create no seam here i there's nothing wrong with that but a lot of times i also work my drop shoulders with more positive ease resulting in a bigger potentially heavier sweater I like having that structure to count on at that shoulder. I don't want, especially depending on my yarn choices, I want that stability there. I want that reinforcement. I don't want just a provisional cast on on my shoulder for something like a drop shoulder. Um, as far as raglans and round yokes go, I tend to love those top down. I mostly knit those top down um, and find that that's great. So I think it's just personal preference. And I love that you have taken it upon yourself to, if you really like a pattern, be like, you know what, I'm gonna reverse engineer this so I can knit it the way that's gonna give me the most joy. And 100% go for it, do it. Like if that is fun for you and it brings you, or at least fun enough that it brings you more joy to be able to knit that sweater the way you want it, where you feel more in control of it, I think that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, but hopefully maybe, this will also give you some more ideas. I'm like, oh, okay, that's a cool reason to knit this bottom up. Maybe I'll give it a try, but you do you. Um, yeah, there we go. And sometimes like for me, I try not to fight my brain and the way it wants to work. So again, this is just like my specific design journey as I come up with an idea and then turn it into a pattern is I tend to try to trust my intuition in where it is leading me on how I can most successfully construct, knit, and create, and write a pattern for the idea that's in my head. And so that's that's what I do, is I, I let my heart lead me and I trust that it's got me on the right path. Um, but yeah, I'm very pro making it work for you and bringing you the most joy when you go to knit something. All right, question number three is about having a cozy hoodie craving. Um, I really want something to really snuggle up in during my first New England spring. I just ordered yarn for your traveler hoodie and I'm excited to get started, but I have a couple question, uh, questions about sizing and adjustments. First, I'd love to have a really generous hood. Do you have any advance for knitting a larger hood on the traveler? My advice, did I say that right? I feel like a word came out of my mouth that maybe... Do you ever have that? We were talking and then all of a sudden you have like a, like an aftertaste in your mouth. <laughs> like, wait, did that, did the correct word come out? Let's hope it did. The question is, how could I make the hood on the traveler bigger? My suggestion is don't. It is a generous hood. So for instance, my friend Candace, we who, slow down Andrea, back it up, give all the details. Candace from the Farmer's Daughter Fibers, myself, and Rachel from Ritual Dyes did a retreat in Mexico last spring, and I designed that hoodie for our trip. So I was thinking about what do I want to travel in? Like, that would be so cozy that I would love to have on a plane, walking through an airport. And I was like, I love having a hoodie. And so the traveler hoodie was born. Candace wore it on the plane to the retreat, which I just was so tickled about. And she loved the generous size of that hood. So she actually put up the hood. She had her headphones, her glasses, and she could just kind of like disappear inside that hood on the flight and nap the flight away. So I think that you, I think that hood is going to be big enough. Um, I do also think it's a little tricky to modify to change the size of it because of the short rows in there. There's no simple way for me to tell you how to make it any bigger than it is outside of maybe going up a needle size. But again, I have a feeling you'd be all right with the size of that hood. It's, it's not a small hood. Like it will fully keep you cozy. Um, <clears throat> and as far as the second part of this question is... Um, sizing in the schematic, I think I'd like a smaller size on the bottom, but a larger size around the bust. Do you have any advice on merging the sizes? I do it when sewing, but haven't tried it in knitting. So I have a kind of fun, easy tip for that. So my friend Rachel loves to do like a nipped in waist. And 
so do a lot of older patterns like Elizabeth Zimmerman and some of those designers when you look at their books like a lot of Elizabeth Zimmerman, Zimmerman patterns will actually have you cast on a lot of them are bottom up and they'll have you cast on the ribbing at the bottom and then right when you switch to the main part of the pattern the main fabric if you will you actually really quickly increase by 20 percent for the body so let's say you had 100 stitches on your needles I can't believe I'm going to try to do this math on the fly when I have this brain fog. So sorry if this isn't right. Um, but you, let's say you started with 100 stitches. You need to increase by 20%. So that first round after your ribbing, when you've gone up to your next needle, you would increase by 20 stitches and then go from there. So that is what you could do so if you want that kind of nipped in waist what you could do is the size you want to achieve by the bust which for you is size four or five that's the size you're going to knit which is also going to give you a slightly bigger hood i think than the size three so this is their question they were saying they kind of want like a size three at the waist size four to five at the bust so pick size four or five and be like this is the size i'm knitting but look at the difference of cast on stitches from size four or five to size three and see how much that varies. And what I would do is I would cast on the size three stitches, work your ribbing, and then that first round into the body increase up to the size four or five and then work the rest of the pattern as though you're knitting the size four or five. Um, your other option could just be to look at the cast on stitches for size four or five, figure out 20% of those stitches cast on 20% less, and then increase after the ribbing. So I hope that made sense. <laughs> That's my advice. Um, so there you go. I think that would look really nice if you want to give that a try. All right, question number four. I love your DRK everyday sweater and have knitted it in three different lengths. Yay! It, it, it was my first sweater and it was really easy to follow. That's so great because I'm just gonna put a little like bop bop right here because so many people ask me, I've never knit a sweater before, what should be my first sweater? So I love to hear back from knitters saying what they knit as their first sweater, especially if it went well for them. So here we go. Great first sweater is the DRK Everyday Sweater. <laughs> all right. Um, after knitting all three, I would like to have a slightly higher back neck but don't know how to add the extra rows. I think another four rows might just be enough. Can you explain how I can add them? So yeah, so what I'm assuming is that you're talking about that short row back neck shaping and you'd like that to be a little bit taller in the back. And I think you could actually do this modification pretty easily. So if you look at the instructions, it's having you work short rows. Boop, 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 boop. And as you go a little bit further, like past wherever you wrapped and turned the last time, then you go a couple more stitches. Oh, but I do it in. Okay, it's going to work either way, but it did just occur to me. Do I do it in the collar? No, I don't think I do it in the collar. No, I don't think I do it in the collar. Okay. Woo. So... All you're going to do is however, let's say, you know, it's having you work your short rows, there's still stitches in between where you end before you start working in the round again. So you could still just work a few extra short rows, just going in a bit further, even if you just go one stitch and turn to the other side, go in one stitch. And I'm talking about after the last stitch you wrapped and turned. So you're basically just extending those directions and just wrap a stitch or two on each side to build up a couple extra rows so it's a little deeper the way you would like it. Um, like if you're only looking to add about four rows, that is just two more sets of short rows. So you're gonna do like right side to here, work or extra stitch, turn to here. That's gonna be your row two, come back, row three, row four. And then you would go to where it says like the final wrap and turn row and then 
end up working in the round again. Um, but it shouldn't be too difficult to do. Just continue, just work two extra sets of short rows. Um, just not eating up as many stitches as the original calls for to make sure you have enough stitches to still pick some up. Um, so again, you can just pick up like, just work like one to two stitches beyond your other short row. Last question. Um, I'm going to skip to the question part. Um, oh no, I have to sneeze. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Woo. My question is this. How do you maintain consistency while spinning? Any tricks of the trade you could share? I would love to hear you ramble on about it when you can. Um, so I have shared this, but I, I'm going to share it again because I think it's one of those things that maybe is helpful. So here has been my most helpful way of remaining consistent. And I keep these on my spinning wheels um, or with my spins in general, but these are reps per inch tools. And these specific ones are from Contrickles. The reason I love hers is she gets really fine. So she has, do you see how fine these grooves get? And then that's bulkier. So any yarn I spin is going to fit in one of these grooves. And so I hang these on my wheels. And what I do is I periodically, <laughs> I periodically stop, pull some of my single off of my bobbin. I'm not breaking it or anything. I'm just pulling it back out of the orifice and I lie it in my groove. And what I try to make sure, and I, okay, what I try to make sure is that I'm consistently at the same thickness. So I jot this number down. These are numbered grooves. So let's say my singles are at this 25 groove. I'll, 25 groove. I'll jot that down in my spinning journal because I will forget otherwise. And I just, every once in a while, check and make sure, okay, this is still filling that 25 groove line. If all of a sudden it starts to get a little too thick or a little too thin, I know I'm losing my consistency and I need to pay attention and check a little more often to make sure that I'm still filling that 25 line. The thing you have to make sure is we are cheaters. We do it with our gauge. We do it with our playback samples. We do it with our wraps per inch tools as we're wrapping our yarn around. We know that we can fudge things a little bit. You know, like when you're measuring your gauge swatch, you can give a little tug and like, oh, look, now it's the right number of stitches. Hey. Um, and it's easy to do with this as well, because depending on how tight you pull on that single is going to depend on how thin or thick that that single appears. So what I do is I keep it under tension because then I know, I know if it's under tension between the orifice and my hand and it's filling the same groove, I know I can do that the same way every single time and I'm not cheating or fudging my numbers. So I keep it under tension. Um, you can do it however you want. You do just need to make sure you measure the same way every time. Um, but that has been my favorite way for staying consistent. The traditional method would be to make a, oh, my sad little not feeling good brain is not gonna, control card. Woo, I did it. Okay, so the, what most very good spinners would tell you is that you need to do a control card, which can look something like this. And what you do with that control card is you wrap a few of your singles around, which is another great way you can then lay your singles as you're going and you pull back a little sample to look. You can lay it right next to it and make sure that you're maintaining thickness. And then you can also attach a plyback sample, which is this guy. So this is me at some point attempting. Here's another one. See, look, I actually did this has my information on it of what I was doing. It has my little guys, my little plyback sample. Um, I'm not great about doing this and maintaining it. I will admit. So I will leave other people who are much. Well, I really went on a kick of it for a little while though. Look at all. Look at these. I just have a whole bunch of them on my desk. I have a little stack of them. I did try for a little while. Um, 
I'm just not great at maintaining those. I have found these help me a little bit more because they're convenient and I'll do it. Um, but that would, that would achieve the same thing. And I do think it's nice to have the plyback sample on there because that's going to help show you how much twist you're playing with and trying to remain consistent on how much twist you're putting in as well. Um, I tend to check that a bit more visually, but that's probably not the greatest way to do it. So that is a big one for me, especially when I'm doing a bigger spin, because I'll tell you what, I think that the biggest thing that's going to help you be consistent is practice 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 spinning 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 spin knit 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 the more you do the thing the better you're going to get the more consistent you're going to get you're going to build up muscle memory and your body's just going to know what to do but as i said i like to i tend to be a sweater knitter and a sweater spinner and so when i am spinning over months and months this large quantity I have learned the hard way not to just think I'm going to remember about how thick I was spinning those singles. And that is when it is really, really helpful to have something that I can check every once in a while to make sure I'm remaining consistent. So either control card and like Ply Magazine has done an entire issue on things like this. I know they talk all about control cards. So that I think they have a consistency issue. I am pretty sure that was one of the names of one of their themes. Um, there's also loads of information out there. You can find a whole blog post written about it. So we're all different, right? Some of us are intuitive knitters and spinners. Some of us are really technical knitters and spinners. So I do think it's about finding out what feels best for you um, and what you can maintain and stick to. And here is really the lesson I'll share is it is so worth it to take the time to figure out what's gonna worth, work for you and then follow through and do the thing because it's a huge bummer when you're plying at the end of this big spin even if it's just a four ounce break to be plying at the end of that and to all of a sudden realize like whoa i was spinning way thicker here and then at some point i went way thinner and i just didn't even realize it i mean i've had it happen where i'm like oh my goodness i totally changed how i was spinning this so having something in place to help you remain consistent is definitely worth it because at the end of the day, we can't undo our spins. You can frog your knitting, but I don't know how to frog my spinning. So taking that extra time, even when I don't want to, because I just want to be spinning, I just want to do the fun part, um, taking that time to make sure and check has always been worth it for me so anyways these are from katrinkles i love these ones those happen to be my favorite um there's lots of versions out there or just simply buy some of these inexpensive little laundry tags and create your own control card to measure against itself and just hang it on your wheel so that you can check every once in a while all right i gotta end this here i gotta go take care of my nose and maybe rest a little bit. So I hope that y'all have a great weekend. Make sure to check back in next week because we are launching a new knit along and the March to May knit alongs right around the corner. So we're going to have two knit alongs happening. Uh, pick your poison, whichever you prefer. You can probably double dip with them. That will all make sense in the future. Uh, if you are not signed up to my newsletter, now is a great time to be signed up because new knit alongs also generally means surprise sales for my knit for my newsletter subscribers. Um, but I will be announcing more of that coming up. Links to the new pattern are below. And thanks so much for hanging out with me this week. I hope to see you back next week. Bye.